Hello, and welcome to Fighting Back the Just Peace Way. I'm Reverend Dr. Susan Thistlethwaite. I'm President Emerita and Professor Emerita of Chicago Theological Seminary. So, fight back against what? I'm going to define, for the purposes of this time together, what we need to fight back again is the manufacture of fear and hate to generate political power. Our context. What is our context? Our context is one of structural violence. Structural violence refers to the multiple ways in which social, economic, political systems expose particular populations to risks and vulnerabilities, leading to increased morbidity and mortality. They're lethal. Those systems include income inequality, racism, homophobia, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, sexism, ableism, and other structures of social exclusion that lead to vulnerability, poverty, stress, trauma, crime, incarceration, lack of access to care, healthy food, physical activity. This fosters hate and fear. You know Colin Kaepernick, and I hope he gets <laughs> picked up by some football team, but even this, peacefully protesting, the structures of racism of our time, just took a knee at a football game, was used to churn up hatred and fear of the victims of structured racism, and was misrepresented, lied about as unpatriotic. Now, if you haven't recently read Orwell's 1984, I wanna strongly recommend that after this meeting together that you're having, run, do not walk, and get yourself your own copy. Every day in the novel, the party members of Oceana are required to watch a film, which whips them up into a frenzy of hate against those deemed enemies of the state. By the end, some of them even hit and spit on the stream in anger. Then they chant, be, be, for Big Brother. Today, this is exacerbated by the internet, and you've seen the graphic I've used here uh, for the PowerPoint. It's the internet. Hate goes viral, hence the wired graphics. Orwell knew how power works, and he wrote, the point is <clears throat> that as soon as fear, hatred, jealousy, power worship are involved, the sense of reality becomes unhinged. And doesn't it feel like that today? I mean, it feels like here's reality, truth, and facts, and here's what's going on. They're not connected. They're unhinged. And as I have pointed out already, the sense of right and wrong become unhinged. There's no crime, absolutely none, that cannot be condoned when our side commits it. Orwell knew his stuff. Just Peace has some insights into how this is a lot of power, okay? And you can't just ignore it. You've got to use it and turn it around. Just peace, as I'm sure you know, is a fourth paradigm on peace and war that goes beyond pacifism, just war and crusade. It's a list of what are called practice norms, a concrete way to advance justice and peace, reduce violence and war. It has been adopted formally and informally by many Protestant denominations, Catholics, Jews, Muslims, Unitarians, and so forth. So it gets around. Now, <laughs> the 10 practices, what has been frustrating with pacifism is that it's, in many respects, vague. The practice norms of just peace are very practical. And the 10 are here. I'm not going to spend any time hardly at all on this. We're going to focus on the first three in this presentation. But they're, in many ways, obvious. 
Support nonviolent direct action. Two, take independent initiatives to reduce threat. Three, use cooperative conflict resolution. Four, acknowledge responsibility for conflict and injustice. Seek repentance and forgiveness. Advance democracy, human rights, and religious liberty. Foster just and sustainable economic development. Work with emerging cooperative forces in the international system. Strengthen the United Nations and international efforts for cooperation in human rights. Reduce offensive weapons and the weapon trade. Get the guns. Get the guns. Encourage grassroots peacemaking groups and voluntary associations, which when I've given talks on this, I say this is how to end war in your spare time. Now, there was nonviolent direction in Oak Park, Illinois. This past Lent, First United Church of Oak Park, Illinois, gathered for Sunday services. And the music had all been composed by people of color. They had decided to fast from whiteness for Lent. And they put a banner in March on the church's front lawn declaring they were fasting from whiteness. And this went nuts in the right-wing media. Fast from whiteness at Chicago Church sparks massive backlash online. And this is the pastor, Reverend John Edgerton. Very clear threat. Articles and broadcasts and rightist media and blogs, thousands of emails poured into the church, many vulgar, some threatening. The church contacted local and federal law enforcement who they say have been helpful. They took their Palm Sunday service online. What to do? Reverend John Edgerton, who is the son of my faculty colleague, Reverend Dr. Dow Edgerton, who has spent a lot of time in Florida, so I'm assuming many of you know him. John called and said, help, Susan, help. So after discussions, this courageous church leadership agreed we would fight back using nonviolent direct action. Now, King, Gandhi, Black Lives Matter are, were experts at engaging the media. Gandhi used the newsreel. King used newspapers, but especially, especially television, the new medium of. Black Lives Matter, Twitter. You gotta be able to use the media and fight back. So we wrote a press release put it right up on the church website, and sent it out to a lot of places. This is part of what it says. Reverend John Edgerton, senior pastor, says this whole practice has been about love. The love of God and neighbor is not only about giving something up, but taking something on. Reverend Edgerton said, justice must be loved into existence. It is the only way. White people absolutely have a place in the redemption story. White people were at the foot of the cross. They were the Roman guards. As white people, we must love our Redeemer enough to put down our spears. We must love our Redeemer more than our whiteness. Now, I wrote a lot of that, but I didn't write the part about the Roman guards. John wrote that. And I said to him, whoa, John, that's really taking it to the mat. But they, they're serious people, and they wrote a serious press release. And, of course, there we go. The press release goes out, media churn. Okay, there's John. John's on all these programs. Of course, Fox didn't leave. They did a press conference in Washington, D.C. Wahajit well, Ali, the New York Times writer, Reverend Bertie Powell's UCC minister, Jackie Lewis, uh, uh, who's at Middle Church? And you know, Craig Howard, and Trevor Chicago Noah, Presbytery, on the Daily Jeff, Show, Jason Carson Wilson, says Church organizes white music for Lent, so forth. You can you read have them there on the, the screen. Pinnacle and John Edgerton, media lead pastor of First United Church of Oak Park, and of course, they put it up on YouTube as well. Wodge uh, is an extremely good friend of mine. I recruited him for this press conference, and Wodge is all in on what they were doing, though, is a Muslim. Uh, but Muslims have had to learn. As you know, 
they have learned from the Jewish community. You have to represent yourself because other people will represent you poorly, if not with bigotry. Reverend Jesse Jackson, who went to CTS, as I'm sure many of you know, and uh, he was finishing up his degree. He went to Selma with Reverend King and didn't finish a couple classes. So when I became president, I called him up and said, you want to finish? And he did. And we were in a tutorial on theology. And while I would say Reverend Jackson appreciates theology, he was saying to me, all these people getting PhDs in the work of Dr. King, and not one of them could call a press conference. And he's right. This is the pastoral skill of the time that we are in. Now, this all ultimately went global. What does it mean for our broader cultural as well as religious struggle for free expression? So what happened? The right was <laughs> very taken aback by, as one uh, 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 right-wing uh, blogger said, they doubled down. And they did. They doubled down. Not, they didn't retreat into the church, take the sign down or anything. They came out. They said, that's why we're doing it. The Easter Sunday service was held in the church. Palm Sunday had been online because of the threats. And John said to me, it feels good to fight back. Now, I said to him, and I discussed this also with uh, General Minister and President John Dorhauer, it was a big mistake for the radical right to attack us at our most powerful liturgical season. You make a mistake in fighting back the just peace way if you don't climb up on your theological profound commitments and stay there. Many of the UCC things that we stand for are now under attack. And you know it. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Marriage equality, reproductive freedom, racial justice, equality under the law, and more. As we make our voices heard more and more, we will inevitably be attacked. Just peace practices can help us prepare and engage in a nonviolent way to get our message out. I suggest that you learn nonviolent direct action as a whole church so you are prepared. The other practices can be helpful besides nonviolent direct action like transforming initiatives. There are UCC pastors I know who are reaching out to groups that rec are affected by structural violence and who are reaching out to law enforcement to engage in positive ways about transforming policing. I want to tell you, I could not have survived as CTS president. If I have a certificate from the Mennonite Peace Center uh, uh, as a conflict mediator. Cooperative conflict mediation, absolutely essential in the church. Absolutely essential. Get into the media. I cannot emphasize this enough. I wish every UCC clergy person wrote for their local paper. Even today, the majority of Americans still get news from their local papers. I wrote for the Washington Post for over 10 years, but now I write for my local paper in Colorado. My, paper, my columns get picked up by other small papers and they go around to small towns. Why not your columns? And use everything. Use Twitter, use Instagram, use TikTok, use Facebook, TV, radio, whatever you can reuse. But we have to be in the media and we have to be expert on it. And when you are attacked, you need to do a threat assessment. John Edgerton now chairs a UCC committee called the Emergency Communications Task Force. I asked John if he had a message for you and he wrote me. It's already happened in Florida as well, to Naples. They just had an ancillary connection to a library event that was targeted by extremists. This stuff will happen. Con congregations should reach out to their conference ministers if it does. We, that is the UCC committee, the Emergency Communications Task Force, can help them with federal law enforcement connections. This is, these are dangerous people. 
And so the first thing you do is do a threat assessment. I don't think the first thing you do is write the press release. Do the threat assessment. And then make sure you have your church. In unanimity, we are going to get our message out. Engaging nonviolently. Church leadership has to be in solidarity. And you can only have one, at the most, two voices. You have to have a consistent message. Choose a simple frame. First church used love versus hate. The media are really bears of Larry Little brain, right? They are beautiful, complex, and intersectional theologies. It won't work. It does not work. They chose love versus hate. And it played. It worked. Take a stand on our theological strengths. This is a struggle for the soul of Christianity. John de Grouchy, the famous South African theologian who also went to CTS, wrote a book that was groundbreaking called Apartheid is a Heresy. White Christian nationalism is a heresy. And Lent and Easter is discipleship, witness, sacrifice, and the power of good over evil. That will stand against hate anytime. Our most profound belief is that evil does not get the last word. That's Easter.